for your glory and in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so um, we're, we're going to be jumping all around. Hold on. We're going to be jumping all around tonight in the Bible, um, but I want to go over a, a couple things with you first before, um, before we, we get into our Bibles. First and foremost, if you're new, you've never been here before, um, my name is Moses. I, I, there's a couple folks out there I haven't really had a chance to meet. Manny, I love you. And um, just saying. And where's your slacker friend? Just saying that too. Um, where is he? Oh, there he is. He's hiding. All right, just making sure. All right, Wilma, love, love. Ah, where's that little cute boy of yours? Is he here? Giovanni, he's here. All right, cool. All right. It, if I, if I don't know you and you've never been here before, let's rephrase that. Please do me a favor. I, I, first of all. Again, like I said, I'm Moses. I'm just one of a team of people that, that this church is, and we, we love each other, and we love you, and we're happy that you're here. And if you want to uh, know a little bit more about our church, please feel free to grab one of these things off of the uh, bookcase here outside this back door here and fill this connection card out and, and just drop it in, in the white box by the door, that little white soldier there, and uh, we'll get in touch with you. And if you have any questions about our church, what we're doing, why we're here, all that kind of good stuff, if you know, want to know something about Jesus, we'll do our best to answer. And if I don't have the answer, or if, some of us doesn't, if one of us doesn't have the answer, we'll find it. You know, no one in here knows all the answers, but we're going to go, we'll dig and we'll find it for you. So um, anyway, thank you for coming. Um, like I said, before we jump into the Bible, um, I just want to go over a couple things with you um, that'll, that'll get us there. Um, we've, been, we've been going through this, this series here called We the People. We're trying to figure out what in the world God has us here for, what we're supposed to do. So we've been going for weeks about this, and tonight's a, a, a different topic, but nevertheless, it's, it's definitely apropos for a series called We the People. We're trying to figure out what, why we're here in this place. There's often times uh, when God will speak not to just one man at a church, you know, give him a message, but oftentimes he will speak to his church, like across the world. There's all these people, you know, like I guess there's like two and a half billion of us. That's a good place for an amen. amen. Okay, it's awesome. He said he was going to grow his church, right, and it's working. We're sitting here in Eustace worshiping this Jesus that was from Israel. That's pretty cool, right? Evidence. So, so um, he speaks to his church. So I think what he's doing, this is just my conjecture, right? I think that God is up there on his throne in heaven. He's looking down on the earth, and he sees his whole church, and he's like, yeah, this is good. This is good, but we're just a little bit off. 
like as a whole, so like in course adjustment. We just just a just a tweak, right? Just a tweak. We got to get you over here. So he starts speaking to his church as a whole, and you'll see this when when all of a sudden, um, if if you go to this church, you go to that church, you go to that church, you put a preacher online, you start reading magazines, and you see preacher after preacher after teacher after church, and all of a sudden, out of the blue, they're all teaching the exact same thing. But let me tell you something. This isn't the Vatican here. We don't get a worship folder that tells us what to do. So, so the Catholic folks, I understand that there's a, a schedule. There's no schedule in the, in, in the, in the Protestant churches. There's no, ch- there's no schedule in the churches of the Reformation. There's nothing like that. So we all just hear from God, preach what we're led to preach. And so when all of a sudden you start seeing one guy after another after another, and they're preaching about the same thing, it's a big thing. Okay, now this is what's happening, right? So, so, so um, um, last week... Um, was it last week or the week before? Uh, mon- the first Monday of every month, we have the pastors from the area come into our church, and, and, and we're, we're, su- we're, we're gathering together, and we're making friends, and we're trying to cross this stupid line. Can you say stupid? This stupid line. Say it right. Stupid line, right? This black-white line that's in Eustis called Orange Avenue. They shouldn't call it Orange Avenue. Call it Black and White Street. That's what it should be called. It's not Orange. It's Black and White Street. And so we come together to cross this line and get together as a unified church to see how we could bless the city of Eustis and spread the kingdom of God to the city. That's what we're trying to do in this, in this pastor thing. So uh, last Monday, the Monday before, I don't know, we get together. So I'm on the car ride in, right? And, and, I'm, and I'm like, all right, Lord, what is it that you want accomplished today? What is it you want of us? What are we supposed to talk about, you know? And it was just like, boom, I want you to get back to what you gathered for, which was to bring the, all the people together, black, white, Latino, Asian, everybody, don't matter. We all got to be one. We got to be one. So that's what I want you to talk about. So I'm sitting, I'm like, okay, okay, that sounds good. Yeah, yeah. What do you want me to do? And so all of a sudden I thought about this, this message that I'd heard about a year and a half ago by a guy, uh, Matt Chandler, and it was on racial reconciliation. And so I was like, you know what? This is what we'll do. We'll play this video. On Mondays, some of you come in here and we, we fast and pray all day long from nine to five. You should come if you don't, okay? It's a great time, but we sit here from nine to five and we just dig into the scriptures and we, and we pray and we watch some quality teaching and I drink coffee till I can't stand it anymore because it's all I can have, right? So this is what we do. So I'm sitting, I'm like, all right, look, we're going to watch this video and, 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 and instead of uh, nine to five and from nine to 10, I sit here and then from 10 till noon, we go in there, I go in there with the pastors and kind of break up. What I'm going to do is I'm going to grab these guys, these preachers, and I'm going to come in here, and all of us together are going to watch this, this sermon on racial reconciliation, and then uh, we'll talk about it. Good idea. Good idea. Uh, so I, I do that, and it's on cue, and it's waiting, and, and the guys are in here, and all of a sudden the preachers start to show up, and I go in there, and, and I'm just greeting them. I didn't say a word about a plan, not a word. And I'm standing there greeting them, they're drinking their coffees, and wouldn't you know what every one of them was talking about? Automatic. I never said a word. I didn't intro into this conversation at all. Racial uh, reconciliation. Racial reconciliation. We've got to fix Eustace. We've got to fix Eustace. He's speaking to the church. And then, right, listen, then, then, then I go home, right? I go home, and and on the, um, the, our group's called Harmony. Perfect name, right? Harmony, Harmony. We're going to talk about that tonight, big time. Uh, this group, one of the guys is the, is the pastor at the Church of Whistling Pines in Eustis. Sean McCracken, he posts something, and, it said, and it's, a, it's from T.D. Jakes. And T.D. Jakes is up there on the stage, and he's talking, not in his message, but he's intro into the service to his, you know, thousands of people. He's got a m- massive monster church. And he's talking about this summit where him and these massive evangelical players, John Hagee and Rod Parr, all these huge guys with leading massive ministries, they're coming to the Potter's house there in, in uh, Dallas, is that where he is? And they're going to, uh, on Thursday, and, and guess what they're going to be talking about? Racial. Racial reconciliation, that we need to be the tip of the spear of the church with the gospel needs to fix this problem. So you see, you see this is all happening, right? So then I go, then I go back on, now that's Monday, and on uh, Tuesday morning, I think it was Tuesday morning, I go to my phone again. I'm like, yeah, I want to watch a, a message. I want to learn something. I'll go listen to what Matt Chandler has to say this week. I want to see what he preached on Sunday. Guess what it was? 
Right, so then I come in on Tuesday night and we're watching the Downpour series from James McDonald. And that was a series that he preached five, six, seven years ago. He had like three major points. Just, I just want, I, this is a stretch, but just guess what one of his major points was. Jesus is right. <laughs> Sunday school answer. Racial reconciliation. He's talking about it again. And I had already decided this is what we have to talk about. It's just like boom, 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 boom. He's talking to the church. He's talking to the church. See, y'all know uh, about Ferguson, right? Y'all know about Ferguson. It was just back in August, right? So there's this, um, and I'm going to say something. Listen, it's a black kid. And listen, I, I, when I say black kid, part of what I'm going to talk about tonight and moving forward, by the way, this is not going away. I'm going to be, you're going to hear this peppered in all year, if not more. Okay, just going to keep coming. Uh, I want to know I, is it even right to call someone black? I mean, like, I don't, I was, I'm a 45-year-old Jewish white kid from the suburbs. I don't know, I didn't know any black people. So I know back in the day, like, you know, it was colored folks, and then it was black folks, and then it was African-American, and some people really think that that's the way you're supposed to call them, African-Americans. Listen, I know one African-American. He's a white guy. He's over at Family Bible. Shannon's their pastor. He's a white guy. That's the only African-American I really know, and he's white. I'm totally confused. So I want to enter in and engage and talk and dialogue and find out. You know, the Bible says that every word out of our mouth should be edifying, building up, right? So if, if calling someone black is wrong, I talked to Greg about it this week. Can I call you black? He's like, I don't know. Just call me, um, what was it? Dark-skinned gentleman. That'll work. You know, call me a dark skin. Okay, but listen. This is the place, the church of Jesus Christ with the gospel at its center has to be the safe environment to enter into this dialogue. We can learn about each other and grow and show what the real church looks like to the world. That's what we want to do, okay? So, so here, here's, listen, and when I mentioned Ferguson, that was crazy, right? Riots and looting and madness, right? This black kid gets shot, a white officer. I, I, listen, let me just say this. I wasn't there. Who was there? Were you there? Okay, so keep your opinion to yourself because it just causes harm. Listen, I don't know what happened. I wasn't there. But I know that someone's life is ended, a precious life that Jesus died for, and he's dead. And, and so because this guy's white and this guy's black, it's madness, looting and fire and craziness, right? And, and so we think we've made all this progress in this country, and we haven't made a whole lot. We haven't made a whole lot. Listen, I want to introduce you to, to Theo and Linda Bob right here, okay? If you, if you don't acknowledge, this is our mayor right here, Mrs. Bob, okay, the city of Eustis. Okay, I want you to... Uh, Theo's my, my brother from another mother, right? This is, this is my guy, right? I got to tell you about this guy, right? I love you, ma'am, but this is my brother, right? This is my brother, right? So, so <clears throat> let me tell you a little bit about, about this, about this guy here. He, uh, he, he grew up here in Eustis his whole life, right, over there. And it's been the same thing ever since he was a little baby boy. And so he, he grows up here, and it's very, very separated. You know, you got all these churches back here. They're called black churches. Like, what is even, what is that? A black church? Yeah. I don't get that whole idea, right? But we're going to, some, some of you are probably feeling it already, like, oh, this guy. But listen, just stick with me. So he grows up here. We got all these churches back here. It's filled with black folks. You got all these churches here filled with white folks, and they're just not blending, you know. So he's, he's here. He's living in that. And he has his career, and he's off in the army, and he goes off to all over the place, you know, army people. And, uh, so, I don't know how, it was 26 years ago, maybe? Was it 26 years ago when you heard the whisper? 23 years ago, he hears the whisper in his ear, son, I'm sending you back to Eustace. No, you're not. Yes, I am. No, you're not. Yes, I am. So he packs his stuff, comes back to Eustace. Why, God, why are you sending me back to Eustace? You're going to be my bridge. You're going to be my bridge. You're going to bridge this thing, this madness that's in this little city. And if you don't think that it's madness in this little city, you don't know what I'm about to share with you. Your mayor and her husband, who's a pastor of the church in the mall, Legacy Church, you all know that, right? In the Leesburg Mall, that's where he pastors. 
So they care about their city. I know everybody hates politicians. Don't hate her. She cares about your city. So, so they heard a rumor because old people like us don't, aren't out late at night. We just hear rumors of what goes on at night, right? So apparently at 2.30 in the morning, racetrack and McDonald's over here at 19, rocking, like packed, packed. So because she's the mayor and she cares and he cares about his city, they get in their car and they do a little stakeout, right? <laughs> they tuck over in the little corner and they see what's going on because see the word in the street is that uh, at 2.30 in the morning in Eustis at the racetrack, you can get, you know, you can get sodas, you can get smokes, you can go to McDonald's, get some food. And what happens is they get out of the rodeo bar and all these other bars and they congregate there, right? Loud music. Everyone's hammered. Your, t your, your hormones are through the, I mean, let's just be honest why you're going out. Your hormones are through the roof. And when you haven't got lucky that night, you're frustrated and ticked. Can someone say amen? amen? Right, it's true, right? So you got, you got hormones, music, and, you got, and, you got, and you're drunk. And there's black, and there's white, and there's racial tension still, and they're in this parking lot, and Eustace knows that it's about to pop off because every Friday night there's six police cars sitting in that parking lot, militarized, waiting for it to happen. That's how close your city is to an explosion. And let me, tell, let me ask you one, can I be real with you guys? You guys have always allowed me to do this. Please let me be real and don't be mad at me, please. Will you allow this? You know, in today's society, it's okay for brothers to call each other nigga, nigga. You heard that. You heard my words, right? You've heard it. You've all heard it said and it ticks you off. You don't like it. But the young folks, they do it. But you try saying the, the ER at the end of it, and you won't see a brother happy, will you? Now, let me ask you something. In this context of everyone's drunk, their hormones, sexually frustrated, loud music, racial tension, and someone says, hey, nigga, get me a drink. And that guy hears one, wa one word that he thought was something else, and out comes the gun. What'd you say to me? And that's how fast this city pops off, and it's waiting to happen. And something has to change. And the church needs to be the tip of the spear that calms the racial tension in the city of Eustace and beyond. We are the ones that have to do it. The Revolution Church needs to be the church that is a sudden and momentous shift in the status quo. We have to lead by example. Okay? Now listen. Thank you. So I've got to tell you something. I remember I told you I was this little, just a little white Jewish boy from the suburbs, right? So uh, i got to admit that um, many of you know Pastor Pete, so you, I don't know, a year ago, he invites me to a meeting in the neighborhood at the Bates Avenue Rehabilitation Project. Is that what it's called? Something along those lines? There's a little, little civic building there in the neighborhood where they're trying to breathe life back into the community. You know, back in there where it's just residential and really just rough. There used to be all kinds of businesses and stuff back there. So they're trying to get it going again. Educating people, you know, bringing faith into the community, cleaning it up, trying to help. So Pete's like, listen, you gotta come. You just got here. You gotta come to this meeting and you gotta, you gotta meet these folks so that you can kind of get what's going on in the city. So I was like, yeah, I'll go, I'll go. But just prior to that, I had gone, I, we had just got here, so I'd gone on a ride with Kelly. It's like, well, we need to check out our neighborhood. You know, what? I mean, we moved here, we needed a building, right? It was the right size, the right money, at the right time. So we're like, okay, we'll go here. But we didn't know what was the reason, because this community doesn't need yet another church that sings, prays, preach, and go home. We don't need that again. There's a reason why we're here, right? So we drive around, and we're driving through here, and it's just real run down, and we're like, how, how is it that, that with, I'm not ripping on these churches because this, this is the old guard now. I'm talking about this is all brand new leadership now in all these churches right here. But you got Lake Eustace Christian Church. You got the big uh, brick thing there that used to be First Baptist Eustace. It's not anymore. It's a, a Pentecostal group from down south. You've got Family Bible, which is now Lake Haven. You've got Orange uh, Avenue Church of Christ. You've got First Eustace down there. You've got the Presbyterian Church here. You've got the Episcopal Church there. You've got the big Methodist Church right there. You've got this church, which was... 
Trinity Evangelical Free, and yet all these churches with thousands of people in it, massive resource, not just money, but, 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 but intellectual capital and experience and mentor and profession, and right on our back step is a run-down dump. What's up with that? How can that be? So we start thinking not on our watch. It may have happened before, but it cannot happen anymore. And what we started to realize when I, when I went over to that meeting with Pete, I, they, they finally got to me and they said, uh, so who are you? What, are you? what are you here for? Or something, you know? And I'm like, yeah, Moses, and you know, whatever. I started talking about me and what we're here for, and, and, and I'm talking about my heart for the city and how we're supposed to unite as one, and all of a sudden I see this brother over there from a, with a smile from here all the way over to here, and this guy is just beaming. He's like, we need to talk. So I'm like, yeah, 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 we need to, he's like, I've, 23 years ago, God said that, that he's, he wants me to come back here to build a bridge, but I've been waiting for a whitey. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we need to talk, right? So, so, so we just, so we're like, yeah, we need to talk. So we start talking, hanging out and everything. And, and, uh, and uh, apparently he's been pastoring Jerome for all these years and he, and he gave us Jerome. So everything you see about Jerome was, a, a, yeah, so that was good, right? So, so, so we got the good end of that, man. We got the, <laughs> he's a good boy now. <laughs> Woo. <laughs> so, so, so anyway, we, so uh, now, now here's the result of all this. So we, Kelly and I get together again. We're sitting here in the lounge uh, months ago. And we're like, okay, what do we got to do? What do we got to do? What do we got to do? Okay, you got to launch this pastor thing. Lord says you got to launch this pastor thing. You got to get these pastors together. You got to make this thing happen. We got to we got to get rid of socioeconomic lines. We got to get rid of color. We got to get rid of ethnicity. Got to get rid of all this stuff and come together as one. That's what we got to do. I got some other brothers in here that, that are passionate about that, don't you? Huh? We got some other brothers in here. So listen, that's what we're doing. That's what we got to do. And listen, I, I'm not saying all this stuff because this is just me. I'm going to take you on a walk through the scriptures, and, and in, in your hand, I, I, listen, today when you got here, you got one of these, I hope. Okay, I, this, is, this is just some, this is just, we, we've, we've spent time to, to put some of the scripture verses here where the Bible is screaming unity, screaming harmony, and I want you to take this and keep it and reference it. Like, I'm not going to go over all of these tonight, but I want you to have it, and I want you to read it, okay? We want you to read it. It's really, really important. But I want to take you through uh, the scriptures so you understand why it's us that has to do this, okay? It's us that has to do this. Let me start here. When God first created, okay, he's creating all this stuff. You read the Genesis account, you're, he's creating trees and oceans and mountains and all these wonderful things. And at the end of his creation, he's like, okay, we got one last thing to do. And so Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they're sitting there doing their creative thing. And they're like, you know what, let's take some of you and some of you and some of you. And man, this is great. We're going to make men and women in our image to be like us. That's what the scriptures say. He didn't say, listen, and you got to understand something. In, in our culture here in America, the predominant culture, we think, when we think Christian, okay, most likely you're going to think of a 60-year-old white dude in a suit. That, that's just been the traditional thought of the Christian. But listen, God said that he's going to make man and women in our image to be like us. This is the concept of, that it's in Latin, imago Dei. The imago Dei is that, that man, women have been created in the image of God. So it's, it's every single human on earth. The only distinction in there is man and woman, which encompasses every person on earth. Would you agree? Every person on earth is, has intrinsic value. We're unique, okay? It's built into us. We have exclusive rights to that. There's nothing in all of creation that is the same as the human being. He created all of us in his image to be like him, to be like us, to be exact. Okay, now that's Old Testament. That's all the way back. This is how he's created us all, okay? Now we jump into the New Testament, 
You see over in Acts 17, go there with me if you don't mind, Acts 17, verse 26. So he's made us all to be like him, and then he's got this, and we understand that we're all different, right? We've got all different types of people on the earth, but he started out by making every single one of us to be like him. Now, there's diversity across the globe, and we all understand that. But look here in Acts chapter 17, verse 26. Is this all the way up, these lights? Because I'm old. Michael, are these all the way up? Okay. Okay, guys, go ahead and laugh now. It finally happened. Okay, so you know I have a denture now, and now I have readers. I will fight anyone who objects right now. (laughs) I'm still young enough to kick. um, Okay, Acts 17. um, uh, Acts 17, verse 26. Y'all there? Okay, listen. here, Here we go. Okay, so we know that he made all men in his image, right? So it says here, from one man, who's that? Adam, okay, and let's, can we include Eve there too, right? They were the first people. But anyway, from one man, Adam, he created all the nations throughout the earth. Now, let's go down to verse 27. His purpose was for the nations to seek after God, seek after him, and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him, though he was not far from any one of us. So listen, the word nations is the word ethnos which we get the word ethnic, all ethnicity. So what he's saying here is that his, he's created us all in his image to be like him, every single person, and we jump all the way to the New Testament, he's still saying the same thing. His desire is that all the ethnicities, every single walk, every single color, every single language, every single person would seek him out and find him, right? Every single person. Now we see the gospel really begin to play out here because remember, as we study the book of Romans, what's happened? He creates everything, the people are there, and everyone across the earth sees that he is real and no one responds well, right? Romans 3 says that no one is seeking God, no one is righteous, no one does good. So we're all failure, but what happens is he wants all those people that are failing in their proper worship to acknowledge him. He wants all of us, all ethnos, to seek him and find him. That's his desire. So the question presents itself, how? How will this happen? We go back into Romans. Romans is the gospel book, man. And it says right here, Romans 3.22, we are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. This is the big part. And this is true for everyone. Say everyone. Everyone who believes, no matter who they are. That's Everyone, can you say it again, please? Because I just want to make sure that you understand that the gospel of Jesus Christ is available to who? And he wants what? Everyone to believe. Every single person, every race, every color, every, both sexes, everything. And so when we read all these things, we understand that this great commission starts to make a lot of sense. To go, right, go and tell all the ethnos all the ethnicities, all the ethnic groups, every color, every, every race, every age, every person, both sexes, across the earth, every single one. Tell them about the availability of his love and forgiveness through Jesus because it's the only way. He wants you to know. See, you know what's amazing though? We will spend thousands and thousands of dollars to go to Africa to tell some, I'm sorry, but black folks, I don't know what to call you, so if I, if, call me out if I'm wrong, so just tell me something, I don't know, okay, I'm white, I don't know, I'm Jew, I don't even know, I'm tan, some, I think, I don't know, but we'll go across the earth with thousands of dollars to go tell some black folks about Jesus, but we won't step foot in that community right there. See, I, wa- I went back there, so, so Theo's like, listen, we're going to fix this problem right now. You and me are going to, you're not going to be scared in there anymore. You and me are going to park here, and we're going to walk to King's Barbecue together. A brother and a Jew. We're going to go in town. We're going to have some barbecue. You know, it's amazing. When we go through there, right, that's, good. that's some good barbecue, y'all, right? All of a sudden, all the white people are like, yeah, man. Yeah. 
You have zero rhythm. <laughs> Theo, show them how to do it, man. Yeah, no, listen, 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 listen. So, so, so we walk back there, but it's amazing, though. When, when you walk back there, he introduced, he knows every single person in Eustace. If you didn't know he knew you, he does. Just watch out. He knows every single person in Eustace, so we're walking down the street, right? And every person that comes up, he's like, hey, man, hey, hey, hey. here's my brother Moses, the pastor of Revolution Church. And, and you know, the, the folks that are a little bit older, they look you in the eye, and they're like, oh, nice to meet you, young man, nice to meet you. But he goes up to a young man. Now, he go, we're at, I remember this specifically. We were over at King's, right, getting ready to get our food, and this man walks up. Listen, that is so enormous. He is the guy that you don't want to run down an alley and meet. He's the guy. He is enormous man, an enormous black man, right? And Theo introduces me to him, and I'm telling you, this man that could have crushed me by looking at me, <laughs> Theo goes, hey, this is the same intro, hey, this is Pastor Moses, and this kid comes up, and he just goes, yeah, man, hey, how you doing? He wouldn't even look me in the eye. So listen, it goes both ways. I was scared to walk in his neighborhood, and it was quite apparent he didn't want me there. And that's pathetic. Now listen, I don't know this city as well as these guys do, but would you say, you know, you know the country says they're 70% Christian. We know that's probably pretty messed up, but at least those that claim it. Back in the neighborhood, would you say that the 70% number that covers the country is probably pretty accurate back there? Yeah. So, so, so the chances are, chances are that here's a black man who has the same Lord and Savior that I do, and I'm a white guy, has the same Lord and Savior that he has, and we won't even look each other in the eye. Now, I can't imagine that my Jesus is smiling at that point. It's not right. It's not right. We gotta fix that. See, you know what the number one, that our, number one, our number one identity should not be Democrat, Republican, Northerner, Southerner, Yankee fan, Red Sox fan, liberal, conservative, black, white, male, female, Latino, Asian. It doesn't make any difference. Listen, if you're Christian, that should be your number one mark. That's, right. That's the most important thing. It's the most important thing. Okay, so we're going out there. We have to go tell everybody about Jesus because it's available and he died for who? Everyone, right? But here's a, here's a big but here. There's a big but. Our sin nature tends to, to kind of want to be selfish for the good stuff, right? L let, let me ask you a question. Do you ever see anybody? Y'all, how many people in here, don't start cussing out Facebook. How many people are on Facebook here? How many times since you started on Facebook did you see someone get on and go, listen, y'all, I found the best fishing hole? No way. <laughs> no chance. You know, fishermen, hush, hush, buddy. How about this? Listen, 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 right? You don't tell anyone, right? How about this? Man, I, you tell him, yeah, because he's got the boat. Okay, so yeah. <laughs> so how, how many people do this, man? How many hunters will, will call their buddies and go, listen, y'all, the biggest buck is right over there. <laughs> That's not going to happen, is it? <laughs> You got a good trip. I heard about your shrimping trip. It was about as good as ours. Except you didn't break down. Thanks, brother. <laughs> We're selfish with the good stuff. We kind of keep it in. And we see this in the scriptures. When, you know, when the church first started, most of these people were Jewish, right? This is, these are the Jews that, that, that God was the God of the Hebrews, right? He was the God of Abraham. He was the God of Isaac. He was the God of Jacob. He was the God of Moses. He was the God of David. He was the God of Solomon. They felt like he was their God. That's our God. And if you want to have our God, you have to dress like us. You have to pray like us. You have to have our same diet. You have to worship the same way. You have to get circumcised. You've got to be exactly like us to have our God. Someone say no. That's stupid, right? That's crazy, but you know what? We're kind of like that. Uh -huh. oh, we're kind of like that. Do me a favor. I want you to see, uh, are we cookie-cutter Christians? Are we supposed to be cookie-cutter church? Go to Ephesians chapter 2. Are we supposed to make everybody like us? Is everyone supposed to be exactly like us? I don't think so. I don't think so. Ephesians chapter 2. This is a, this is a strong rebuke to those, uh, to, of course, to the Hebrew folks who think they all have to, everyone has to be 
like them, but like us, it's the same thing. He's speaking to us. It's, it's prescriptive. It's for us too. So here's the gospel. One of the things that the gospel screams is this, is, is reconciling people to each other, not just to God. Verse 14 of Ephesians chapter 2. For Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people. Well, now listen, listen. Do you know what? Jews were God's chosen people, right? It was so you were either a Jew and you were in, or you were anything else was out. So what he's saying here is that he has made one people of, that's that same word I asked you earlier, what's that? Everyone. Everyone. He's made, he's hit, what Jesus is doing on the cross is he's making one people out of everyone, right? Oh, I can't read, oh, this is horrible. I'll take a couple weeks to get used to this one. Um, <laughs> whew. For Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people when in his own body on the cross he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. He made peace between, I'm going to uh, to verse 15, the second half. He made peace between Jews and Gentiles by creating in himself one new people from the two groups. Together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of his death on the cross and our hostility toward each other was put to death, okay? So that same thing applies to us now. The hostility between those that were in and those that were out, now God has poured out his spirit on the Gentiles too. We're one people. Every single Christian is part of one body that Christ has brought together on the cross, okay? We're one people. We're one people. So should we be a cookie cutter church? You have to look like me. You have to dress like me. You have to walk like me. You have to talk like me. You have to pray like me. Your music's got to be my style. No, no. I want to read this to you. A lot of scripture. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Jer- uh, Jared. <laughs> what page is it? I don't know. Might be on the screen. Ish. 20? You got 20? Really? He said he'll bet me 20 bucks. It's not on 784. Um, Is it wrong? Well, I must have not been wearing my glasses. Oh, sorry. How did I even? That's not even close. Are you ready? Cookie cutter church. You ready for this one? Listen, listen, listen. This is Paul, right? He says, I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ. So could you, could you um, agree with me that this is like if Jesus himself was talking to you, right? He's talking to you. So listen up. Paul says, on the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ to live in harmony with each other. Let there be no divisions in the church. Rather be of one mind united in thought and purpose. So what we see here is two things. Yes, we're to be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. So we all have to understand that it's like Jesus is the only way. We are are charged to go tell the world about him. He's the creator. He's the sustainer. He went to the cross for all of us. We have to go tell the world. I get that. And that's our purpose, to know Jesus and to make him known, right? We got that. Everyone, no matter what ethnos you are, if you're a Christian, that's united in purpose. We get that, right? Are we all on page there? But it also says that this is going to be displayed in diverse ways. Harmony. See, we're supposed to have the same thought and purpose, which is we love Jesus. He's the only way. Go tell. I get that. But in diverse ways, because it says to live, this is in the authority of Jesus Christ, the one who went to the cross for you. He said that we are to live in harmony. That means all different ways, all different styles, all different ethnos coming together. All of us have the same thought and purpose to go spread the kingdom, but we do it in diverse ways. Harmony, right? And, and you can't, don't, you all agreed a couple weeks ago this was actually God's word. You still agree? 
Okay. So you agree. And if you look at that verse, don't take the Bible lightly. Don't blow past the words. The words are chosen carefully by God. To live in harmony with each other. Right? That doesn't, like, like harmony is, is, is soprano and alto and bass and all that different voices that on their own are beautiful, but when they come together, right, it's even more beautiful, right? So, so it doesn't mean that there's a, an alto down the street there and a, and a soprano down the street there and a bass all the way down there. What? Can't hear it. They have to come together to make beautiful sound. So that's why it says to come together as one people in diverse ways. None of us deserve God's love. None of us deserve his forgiveness and salvation, but all of us get it. All of us, no matter who we are. So it makes sense when the book of Romans, Paul says in Romans 12, 16, to live in harmony with each other. Not apart, together, together. Let me, let me share this verse with you too, Romans 14, 19. This is the book of Romans. This is, the, this is the, the, the book in the Bible that absolutely explains the gospel. So this isn't, the, the gospel isn't that, that white and black and Latino and Asian, all that should live together, but it screams this. This is a result of what Jesus has done. So Romans 14, 19, bless you. It says this. We're to live in harmony, right? We just heard that in, in Romans 12. Romans 14, 19 says, so then let us aim for harmony in the church and try to build each other up. We're to aim for harmony. That means it's, it's the target. It's the goal. That's where we're supposed to be going. We're supposed to be moving toward that thing. How many people go out, listen, and, and, and take target practice and stare at the target and never shoot at it? That would be what we call stupid, right? So, so the whole thing is you're supposed to aim for harmony. That's supposed to be where we're going. We're supposed to be working intentionally toward that, embracing everybody, welcoming everybody, wanting their, their backgrounds, wanting their traditions, wanting their styles, wanting their language, understanding each other, embracing one another, engaging in dialogue, finding out your history, find out your aches, find out your pains, find out your victories. We're supposed to weep with those who weep and celebrate with those who celebrate, all of us together as one, intentionally moving toward that thing. Do me a favor also, we're in, we're in Romans again, Romans 15, 5 and 6. I need a drink. So we're supposed to live in harmony, we're supposed to shoot for it, we can't do it on our own. Kind of tough to do. Let's face it, we have some preconceived notions. You know, when I walked into that neighborhood, when I drove into that neighborhood, sorry, to go meet Pete with the city leaders... I was fearful. I mean, I admit it. I was fearful. And, and I don't know why. Like, I don't even know a single person back there. No one's ever threatened me. No one's ever snarled at me. No one's ever shot at me. No one's ever done anything. But for some reason, I walk in there with all these preconceived notions of fear of black people. Like, what is that? Like, it's just all, it's like um, false reputation and false accusation and all this, it's stupidity that I walk in with that makes me fearful. And so I think God understands us. So he says when we should live in harmony and aim for harmony and shoot for harmony, and that's the goal, I think he understands there's some apprehension. It's hard for us to do that. So this is his advice to us. Let me put on my old man glasses again. It's awful. 15.5, may God who gives this patience and encouragement, help you live in complete harmony with each other as is fitting for followers of Jesus. Now listen, that means that's what we're supposed to be. There's no exception. There's no, well, that might be good for them, but not good for us. We're, we live in this community. It's just this all white folks here, and we're in that community, so it's all black folks over there, and we're over that community. It's all Latino over there, so that's who we are. But look, at it says here, live in complete harmony with each other as is fitting for followers. Not some, not just for the white people. 
for followers of Jesus Christ. Now listen, this is beautiful. This is, this is beautiful. This is harmony. When this happens, then all of you can join together with one voice giving praise and glory to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's awesome, man. That fires me up. That's the way it's supposed to be. Listen, there's no such thing, we learned last week, as love without like. There's no such thing as loving at arm's length. Like, I love you, but we're not going to have coffee together. I love you, but don't ask me to change your tire. I love you, but we're not going to really hang out. There's no, such, there's no such biblical precedence for loving and not liking. We're supposed to like, right? So there's no such thing as love without like. There's no such thing as love at arm's length. There's no such thing as separate harmony. It don't make any sense, does it? It, it, it contradicts its own definition. You can't be separate and harmonious at the same time, okay? Romans 12, 15 says that we are one body and that we belong to each other. We belong to each other. I remember the Archie Bunker episode when he got a blood transfusion from a black man. <laughs> it's crazy. Listen, as Christians... We have the same blood going through our veins. It's Jesus' blood. We're all under the blood of Jesus Christ. Black, white, male, female, young, old, Latino, Asian, every one of us. We all are Christians. It doesn't make any difference. We all belong to each other. There's a closeness. There's an intimacy between us. At least it should, it should exist, and sometimes it doesn't, sadly. I want to do a, do a favor, do me a favor, and I want to read something together with you as a family. It's found in the Old Testament. All this stuff is New Testament. And for all those people that say that it's different then and it's different now, okay, I want you to understand it's one scripture. It's one Bible, right? Do me a favor. Can you, I think I've got it up on the, in, yeah, I'd like to do this. I'd like to read this together. Can you all see? It's kind of small for those in the back, but can you see it? Can you all see it? Okay, yeah. Kill that light right there. Maybe it'll help. I want to read this together. And then we'll kind of chew, we'll chew on it a little bit. You ready? Let's go. How wonderful. No, keep, keep this up. First and foremost, I love the beginning because it's just so simple. No one has to think. It's wonderful and pleasant when we live what? What's the word with a T? Together. Not in separate places, right? It doesn't say we're going to open up a commune, y'all. I'm just saying that we come together. We don't always live together, but we come together and live together in harmony. It's pleasant. It's wonderful. It's good. And he says, for harmony is as precious as the anointing oil. So this, they, they anointed Aaron as this high priest that was this intercessor between God and man. There was power in this man. He was a special man. He was set apart as special for God. And then it also says that harmony, not only is it, is that, is it special and anoints his people as someone special when there's this harmony together, but it also says that harmony is like the dew that brings life. He says where there's harmony, the Lord has pronounced his blessing, and his blessing is even life everlasting. So when you, when you talk about a church that you want the light to be beaming out of here so the world can see, the greatest light will come out of a church that has harmony within it. Black and white and Latino and Asian and black, all of them together, when we live together in harmony, that's when the world will see beauty, and that is the beauty that Revolution Church must bring to the world. That's what it has to be. That's where there's life. That's where there's life, where there's harmony within the church body. Listen, we can't just claim to be unified simply by stating that we have the same Savior and God. Okay, lots of people say that Jesus is their Lord and Savior over here and over here, and that doesn't mean that we're necessarily unified. Okay, what we do and who we do it with and where we do it are vital to authentic unity being seen and existing. 
You, it, it, it depends on who you're with. You can't just say we're unified if we're not living in harmony. Right? You have to be doing this thing intentionally together. Okay? Intentionally together. Listen, if we're to cover the earth as Jesus' witnesses so that all the world can see God's love in Jesus Christ, it's best expressed in how, as a community of diversity, how we come together, and Jesus said, you'll know that they're my disciples by the way they love each other. And his love is best expressed in community, all of us together. That's the fullest, most beautiful expression of God's love is in the community of believers loving each other. And then they will know, by the way, you love each other. Listen, it's not just white loving white. It's not just black loving black. It's not just Latino loving Latino. Jesus Christ, he prayed all the time. You know this, but there's very few times we actually know what he prayed. And in John 17, he actually prayed to his father. He said, I pray, Father, that they would be one just as you and I are one. You can't tell the difference between Jesus Christ the Son and, and the Father. They are one. He is the express image of the invisible God. I and the Father are one, right? It's, um, they're, they're, they don't bicker. They don't complain. They're not trying to posture and get each other's way. They work well together, don't you think? I think so. I never heard of one argument. And all, the, script, the Bible's thick. We can't even go a week with our spouse without fighting. And that whole book is like thousands of years, like tons of time with all these different people. I never saw God the Son and God the Father fighting. Never, never one time. And he wants us, and I don't even understand all that, how we could really be one. Like, I don't even understand how the Father and the Son are one. That's crazy supernatural stuff, right? But that's what he wants. That's what he wants. Do you think that they would, if, if, if like, you know, everyone always says that Jesus is the pastor of a Christian church, and he is because he leads, but if he was literally the guy up here, right, and his dad was sitting over there, do you think that they would fight over, you know, I don't think the people like the offering plate. Well, I think that they should use the box. Well, I think the plate is good. So let's, do you think they fight about it? <laughs> oh, look at that, dad. Look at that guy, he's got tattoos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, son, did you just see her skirt? <laughs> I'm just not quite sure that they would do that. He said he wants us to be one as they are one, John 10, go there. We need harmony. So here's Jesus talking again, which means you should, yeah, I should listen. Okay, John chapter 10, verse 14, Jesus talking again, he says this. You know, we know we're supposed to be one, united, harmonious, working together, loving each other. It's the love feast. Remember, last week? It's the love. No, I'm not going to do that. Okay. I'm not going to do it. I'm so tempted. Temptation is not of God. I'm not doing it. Okay. 1014 says this. Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd. I know my own sheep and they know me. Just as my father knows me, and I know the Father, so I sacrifice my life for the sheep. I have other sheep too that are not in this sheepfold. And I must bring them also. They listen to my voice and there will be one flock with one shepherd. So in other words, he says, listen, and then he's talking, he goes over to the, to the black church and he says, listen, um, you're not black, but I'm going to use you anyway, okay? <laughs> I love you guys, and you're in the family, but I got some white folks over there, and I know that they're not like you, but I died for them, and I love them too, so I'm going to go get them and bring them over here. Is that cool? And you have to say, yeah, <laughs> yes. yes. Yes, thank you, yeah. And since I said you were the black guy, I'm going to go over here to the black guy, and I'm going to say, so he goes over here to the black church, and he says, listen, um, I love you, to the white church, and he says, I love you, and you guys are doing pretty well here, uh, but I have some other sheep that are not like you, and I know you might find that a little uncomfortable, but I laid down my life for them, and I'm going to go get them, and I'm going to bring them over here, and you're going to say, okay. 
Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. That's the only appropriate answer when God tells you to do something is yes, sir. Okay, just, just to let you know. Okay? So that, that's what he's saying here is that there's people that are not in your sheepfold. They're a little bit different than you, but I laid down my life for them, and I'm going to bring them over here. I'm going to go after them as well. And since we're supposed to be like Jesus, I'm kind of thinking that we should be intentional in that effort as well to go after all different types of people, even if they don't look like us, dress like us, talk like us, have the same experiences as us. Okay, we're different. But we're all one. Can you say that? We're all one, right? Now listen, this is one of my favorite sections of Scripture as we get ready to land the plane here. I want you to go with me to Colossians chapter 3. I love this. I started when I preached, when I first started preaching, I was here. And here I am, I don't know, 10 years later, and here I am again. I love this, I love this, I love this. I remember sharing this again in the, over at the First Methodist of Tavares in the sanctuary where we had like 12 people there at Mo. Was there even 12 there that night, Kyle? I don't even know. There might have been seven. It was brutal. This massive room and there was like nobody there. But we preached this message and it was this. Um, let, me, let me ask you a question. Who in here, pr- loud and proud, who's a Christian? Yeah. Okay, awesome. Now, so you've been born again? You've been transformed, you're different, you're regenerated, right? Rebirth, new person, new life. It says that if you're in Christ, the old has died, and behold, the new man, right? That's you, right? Okay, that's a little strange for you ladies to be the new man, but that's fine. In this new life, it doesn't matter if you are a Jew or Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbaric, uncivilized, slave or free, Christ is all that matters, and he lives in all of us. That's everybody. So what he's saying here is like, like whether you're the religious or you're not, if you're one of God's chosen and you think you're something special, hoorah, I'm a Jew. If you're that or you're not, if you're circumcised or not, if you're rich, if you're poor, if you're black, if you're white, if you're slave, if you're free, it doesn't matter who you are because your greatest identification mark is Jesus Christ. The blood of Jesus covers us all and makes us one family. Okay, it makes us one family. Now, I'm, I'm close. There's a guy that gets it. I want you to see an example of what I'm talking about. It's in one of the smallest books in the New Testament. Hardly anyone ever references it. Hardly anyone ever reads it. I love it. It's the book of Philemon. Now, in the book of Philemon, here's a perfect illustration of this gospel um, 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 outpouring. Uh, this, not, this, 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 this result of the gospel. Here's the story of, of the Apostle Paul, right? He's in jail because he's preaching. He's in jail, and there's this guy, Onesimus, who's a slave. Now, I don't know what color he was or how old he was or whatever, but the fact remains is that he's a slave, So when Paul says it doesn't matter whether you're slave or free, here's a perfect illustration. Now, he's a slave. So in our world right now, we don't have slaves, but we have some that are really, really, really hurting. Socioeconomic classes are still existing. We've got rich, we've got poor, you know, and there's that separation. It's unfortunate. So here's this guy who's a slave, looked down on in society, I'm sure, Right? Not only that, but as a slave, you're just a piece of property. You are nothing. You are as valuable as this chair. If you own this chair, it's the same as if you owned a person. You're nothing. So this guy, he runs away from his his owner, Philemon. And so what's that mean? Theft. So not only is he a slave and looked down on and shunned and looked like, like they're nothing, not only by society, but by the owner. But the guy stole himself. So now you've stolen. For, so now he's a criminal on top of it. So I want you to see what happens. In Philemon, it's only one page. If I could get there. Verse 16. All right, oh, yeah. It's terrible. I'll get used to it eventually. I was thinking about doing the old guy thing like this, but that's just, I'm not ready for a minivan. I know I'd get something, I'd get flack on that one. 
So, he, so listen, so, fi, so, so Onesimus runs away, and guess what? He gets put in jail next to the Apostle Paul. Guess what he's going to get? Sir. The gospel. No duh, right? So he gets the gospel, and look, he gets saved. He gets saved. So here we are. Sorry about that. I'm gross. I know. So he gets saved. Now verse 16. He is no longer like a slave to you. He is more than a slave, for he is a beloved brother, especially to me. Now he will mean much more to you, both as a man and as a brother in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. I mean, so Paul's going, you know, like Paul's a special guy. And, and when, when he comes to town, you know, you, you lay out the bed for him, you have dinner prepared for him. He's a big guy, right? He's important. And Paul's going, you know what? This slave that was nothing to you, and he, did you notice one thing? Did you notice his words? He didn't even give the guy the option. No, you will consider him a brother. Like, it's not an option. That's who he is. His identity has changed. He's no longer just a slave. No, he's a brother in the Lord, and that's the way you will treat him. And that's an order from the Lord to us tonight. That is the way you will treat people. If they're Christians, they're your brother or sister in Christ. You will treat them as if Paul was walking in here right now. It's the same thing. No different. You know, there's a, I'll leave you with this. There's a, there's a, there's a picture in the, in the Bible of exactly what we need to do. It's a beautiful picture. Before I tell you that picture, remember how Jesus' prayer was, let your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven? Can I share with you what church is in heaven? Can I do that? Look at, well, you know what? Why don't you just listen? If you can read it if you want. I'm going to go to the book of Revelation. Ooh. Ooh. Revelation chapter 7. This is awesome. Let your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Here's First Baptist heaven. First Presbyterian heaven. This is the first church of heaven right here. This is his church. I'm going to try. After this, I saw a vast crowd, too great to count, from every ethnos and tribe and people and language standing in front of the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed in white robes and held palm branches in their hands and they were shouting with a great roar, salvation comes from our God who sits on the throne and from the Lamb. They're all together in one voice praising God from every ethnos and race on the planet together. Let your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. So aiming for harmony doesn't just mean accepting diversity. It means to aim for it, to shoot for it, to go moving towards that, living and functioning as a church, intentionally welcoming in diversity. Listen, I want... I want a black family to walk in here and, like, you remember Pentecost when they all heard their own language being spoken? I want Pentecost on this stage. When they walk in, I want them hearing their language. When Latinos walk in, I want them hearing their language so they know that we want them here, that they are welcome here, that we invite them here, and we embrace them and love them here, just like Jesus does. So we need to intentionally move toward that, welcoming in dialogue from different people and learning each other's cultures and inviting them into our church. Jesus is black, he is white, he's Latino, he's Asian, he's Native American, he's Russian, he's Pacific Islander, he's Creole. He's all of it. And this old, this old Jim Crow law garbage of separate but equal, that's still living in the church and it's garbage and it needs to die. And the gospel is the only thing that's going to fix that. We need to lead the charge. Revolution Church, is, that's the reason why Revolution Church is here. He brought us here not to pray, preach, sing, and go home. 
But he came, we were here to change that, to embrace the cultures and bring them together in one family. And that's what we're going to push. And I know that's, I'm not going to stop. We're just going to keep going. We're going to keep going. Orange Avenue needs to change. It can't be like this anymore because I'm telling you, we're this close to craziness. And the only thing that's going to fix it is the gospel. It's not a government program. It's not Republicans and Democrats. The only thing that's going to fix it is the love feast, y'all. That's it. Right, brother? That's it. That's it. All right, listen. I'm going to ask the gentleman to come take communion together as a family. All right? I'm sorry, guys. I didn't. Look, watch. You ready? Now you can come. Amen. Amen. I blew it. I blew it. Listen, I love you guys. I want to pray with you, and then we're going to, we're going to take communion together. So we're going, to, we're going to hand out the stuff to you, and then I want you to hold on to it, and we're going to take it together as a family, okay? Let's pray first, and then we'll take this together. Lord, I thank you for this, uh, for this word tonight. I thank you, Lord, for going to the cross and paying for our sin. I thank you, Lord, that not only did you, did you accomplish reconciliation between God and us, but you also died on the cross to bring us all together as one family, living together in harmony. I thank you for that, Lord. Let this word not leave our ears. Don't let it evaporate, but let it just press into our minds and heart and last. Lord, help us to be the church that changes and leads the charge. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God. Powerful word, my brother. We're reminded tonight as we are preparing to partake of the Lord's Supper together. We're reminded of that night our Lord was to be betrayed as he sat at the table with, with his disciples. Knowing full well what was getting ready to happen, they didn't know, but he knew. And even the betrayer he served the betrayer. So for us tonight, as we partake together, we're reminded of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and our relationship to him. So on that night they were at the table, he took the bread and he broke it. He gave thanks to the Father for it. And he said, take, eat, this is my body. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup it was one cup, and this represents one cup for us. As he prayed and gave thanks to the Father for it, he said, this is a new covenant that I make with you. He said, take, drink all of it. This is my blood. Do this in remembrance of me until I come again. And in doing so, we identify with our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. Be glorified, O oh Father. In Jesus' name.